Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Alexander Bulyakov. I'm a, a PhD student at Boston University, and I'm an intern at uh, Red Hat Research. And I'm excited to talk to you today about um, some of the work that I've been doing on uh, fuzzing and virtual devices in, uh, in hypervisors. So I think we've probably all seen uh, a picture similar to this, you know, explaining what the cloud is, what, what the hypervisor's job is. Um, but to sort of uh, give a brief reminder, um, the job of a hypervisor is this piece of software that's running on a system and it's trying to partition the resources of that system uh, among various different tenants. Um, and these tenants, they, they care about running applications um, and the hypervisor uh, is providing resources to these applications and also providing isolation between these applications. Um, and traditionally, the way this is done is, you know, there's a fully virtualized operating system allocated for each tenant. So the uh, OS that's running on the server is, is virtualizing multiple uh, additional OSs for each tenant. And uh, I briefly mentioned isolation. Um, and what I mean there is, you know, one of these tenants might have might have been compromised, or maybe they are malicious from from the start. Um, and the job of the hyper uh, hypervisor and the cloud provider is to prevent this malicious tenant from negatively affecting the other workloads of uh, of the other tenants, and from um, and 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 further from you know compromising the actual underlying server. So this would be the bad scenario where um, this compromised guest is able to break out of. Uh, the isolation guarantees of uh, the hypervisor and um, and run code at the privileged level of the hypervisor. Um, and to sort of understand how something like this might happen, well, let's uh, let's rewind and let's remember. So the 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 hypervisor is running on a server that's running on real hardware, but these guest operating systems they were also designed to run on hardware. Our, um, or something that looks like hardware, at least. So all of them expect to have this sort of view that they are they are the ones, in fact, that are interacting with the hardware. And anytime an uh, application running in a guest wants to uh, communicate with the outside world or communicate with the hypervisor, it has to do this through this uh, device uh, this device layer. So the hypervisor provides these virtualized devices that govern the access. Uh, and the resources that the uh, uh, that all each of the guest VMs share with the outside world, and um, since this is the critical interface, uh, this virtual device interface, this is the one that we're interested in protecting these these virtual devices. But the problem is that um, when you're building a virtual device, uh, sometimes you're lucky enough and you have a spec for a real device that you're basing your vir virtual your code off. And you know, you just read a, a couple hundred or a couple thousand pages of of spec, and then you sit down and you write a, a bug-free virtual device, right? Um, or uh, so, or sometimes you can write your even your own spec for uh, a power virtual device, which um, which is interesting. But um, in the worst case, you actually don't uh, don't have a spec that you can uh, that you can design a device based on. You either have to reverse engineer the actual device, or you have to reverse engineer a, uh, a driver for that device and go from a driver to a virtual device driver. Um, and as you can probably guess, you know the each each time you want a virtualized device, that can be weeks or months of work, and they're often implemented in fast but unsafe languages such as C. And in general, this is just a very error-prone process. So it's this is a little scary that you know this is this is the code that's governing governing the um, the isolation guarantees uh, that uh, that you know we expect from the cloud. And unfortunately, bugs in in these uh, di virtual devices aren't just a uh, theoretical problem. Um, in fact, there's bugs found all the time in hypervisors, and uh, the common thread between most of these bugs is that they they are, they live in the virtual device code, which is a huge uh, percentage of the um, code of a typical hypervisor. Probably the the most um, well known bug of this type it was the Venom vulnerability, which was discovered in 2015. 
And this one is actually quite a simple, you know, buffer overflow type vulnerability that you learn about in any class that in any class where you learn the C language. Um, and uh, what, what's worse, it was it was in a floppy disk controller, which basically exists uh, is connected to a bunch of virtual machines and hypervisors such as Zen, VirtualBox, and QMU uh, for legacy reasons, right? Because uh, PCs originally had uh, floppy disk uh, controllers. Um, so if 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 these were the types, th this bug bug sort of made people wake up to the fact that you know the security of these virtual devices really needs to be taken a lot more seriously. Um, and so looking at what a lot of the the, the other the rest of the industry has been doing, um, well, fuzz testing has gained a lot of traction. Uh, so when you do normal testing, you you write some manual tests and you make sure that whatever the result of your test uh, uh, running over an application is, it's, it's what you'd expect, right? Um, fuzz testing uh, from a bird's eye view is basically the same exact uh, concept, but instead of you writing a manual test, you let the computer use a random number generator to provide some randomized data to your application. And you make sure that, you know, in general, your application sort of behaves properly uh, and doesn't just completely crash. Um, so, that's basically that's basically fuzzing. You know, you provide randomized inputs to your application. You make sure that you know your your application doesn't um, crash spectacularly. Yeah, usually you can get more advanced with that, um, but that's that's in general um, what fuzzing is uh, used for. And if, uh, in fact, there's a lot of fuzzing work that's that's gone on, and it's been combined with, for example, coverage information, where you can track the coverage that each of your fuzzer generated inputs achieves. Um, over your uh, application, and based on that, you can sort of judge whether that input produced some interesting behavior, or whether it was just something that didn't completely didn't make any sense in the context of the program. And if it was interesting, you store it for later, and you use that uh, saved input as the basis for further mutations. Um, and and you can also build your program with sanitizers to find entirely uh, different classes of bugs that are typically hidden. So simple enough, right? Um, this fuzz testing has completely, you know, uh, has has proven to be very powerful. It's used in a lot of domains, ranging from like image parsing libraries to even the kernel. So we just need to find, you know, where the virtual devices are and provide them with these fuzzer inputs, right? Um, well, that's a little bit easier said than done. So if we look at the input space for a, a device, so how the CPU interacts with typical devices. First, we have uh, on x86 machines a uh, address space of 64K addresses, each of which can be mapped to a particular device. And when the CPU wants to interact with uh, these port devices over port IO, it uses a special instruction such as in or out um, uh, to read or write a value to this device. And when that instruction is executed, the device receives the request, it does whatever it needs to, and then the CPU continues the, its execution. And then in a very similar uh, vein, you know, we're all used to programming with memory and using memory. Well, parts of memory can actually be mapped to uh, devices as well with memory mapped I.O. And in the, these cases, instead of when you read or write from those addresses, um, instead of them, uh, those requests hitting RAM, um, they end up uh, also getting routed to the uh, to the devices, and then the device again does whatever it needs to to um, uh, to handle that request, and then the CPU continues execution. And right off the bat, there's um, some complications here. So, uh, for one, uh, a lot of these uh, memory mapped and port I/O regions uh, aren't actually mapped uh, as soon as you boot the machine. You actually have to go through, for example, PCI configuration to enable further memory regions. So when you before you actually start running any code on the CPU, you, you, you have no idea when and where um, a lot of these uh, memory mapped and port IO regions are going to be. So it's not something that's set in stone, and they can, they can uh, shift around based on your interactions with the devices. And then what, it, what makes this even worse is that there's actually a third mode of I.O. that's uh, very commonly used, and that's uh, DMA or direct memory access. So the problem with port I.O. and memory mapped I.O. is that for each you know, byte or set of bytes that you want to 
communicate to the device. You have to, uh, you know, the CPU has to run an instruction, wait for, uh, wait for that request to go through, and then, you know, uh, run another instruction and, and so forth. So this is this really wastes a lot of the CPU's time, and it's it's quite a slow um, for high bandwidth applications such as you know network cards. So for these uh, cases, we have direct memory access, where instead of writing the actual data to the devices, uh, all the CPU has to do is it writes the address and the length of, uh, or it just writes the address of some data to uh, a virtual device or to a device over port IO or memory mapped IO. And then the device will asynchronously go ahead and read um, read the data from that data from memory. Um, and then once it's done handling that, for example, it can uh, like raise an interrupt or uh, or uh, something like that to communicate to the CPU that it's done processing that input. So the CPU is free to run whatever code it needs to in the meantime. And this is great for high bandwidth applications um, such as network, uh, disk, you know, video. Um, but this is also a nightmare for a fuzzer because it means that our input space encompasses all of memory, all of memory basically. And uh, because of the PCI mappings that I mentioned, our input space also encompasses all of port IO. So if we want to fuzz a virtual device, we have to consider this entire input space, um, which is absolutely intractable for uh, in, an off-the-shelf the shelf, uh, fuzzer. Um, considering that, you know, combined this can be gigabytes or even exabytes if you're talking about a 64-bit machine um, of input space. So this this is the main problem with fuzzing um, virtual devices on hypervisors is this uh, huge input space. And to sort of uh, emphasize this point, I want to briefly walk you through uh, an actual bug that our uh, fuzzer discovered. Um, I'm not sure why that tab is down there, but... Um, uh, instead of uh, actually trying to explain what it does, I just copied an email that uh, one of the developers that was fixing this bug in, in this E1000 network card um, uh, uh, responded with to the original bug report. So they say the bug is interesting, which is probably you know as much praise as you can expect um, when you're reporting a bug. Uh, and... Uh, and then on the left, I have the actual uh, port IO and memory mapped IO and memory instruction uh, inst uh, operations that lead up to the bug. So first, as I mentioned, there's this PCI controller that can map additional memory mapped IO regions. And that's basically what these instructions do. And they lead to this memory mapped IO region down here being created for the, uh, the E1000 device. And then once that's done, we can start interacting with that memory mapped IO region. And, and in this case, we basically set up a packet transmission request. Um, and you might notice that there's these purple regions that appeared. Well, these are the DMA, uh, these are two DMA buffers that are to uh, actually reproduce this, uh, this bug. Um, so these, these could as well be anywhere in memory. They could have been all the way over here. It's just that the address that happened to be written up here in this instruction um, uh, provided this, this particular location. Um, so uh, I actually drew this picture slightly inaccurately because the bug entails the fact that, uh, is, involves the fact that this region over here actually overlaps the devices, the E1000 devices memory mapped IO region. So when the E1000 tries to write to this DMA buffer, it actually ends up writing to its own memory mapped IO region triggering a reentrancy bug and basically it ends up freeing some resources that uh, that sh that were still in use causing a, a use after free bug um, so I, th I guess the takeaway here is that we needed to rely on all three um, modes of IO in order to reproduce this bug uh, in order to generate this bug and also if you just look at like these addresses here, um, there's the, it just emphasizes that the input space is enormous. The, the, ad, the actual addresses we write to are only a tiny, tiny fraction of uh, all of the possible addresses. And the fuzzer generated from this from scratch. Uh, and the, so this is sort of what the crashing trace looks like. As I said, this is a reentrancy bug. So down right here, we have this segment of uh, E1000 E code. And then, uh, and then there was this uh, DMA access that I mentioned, and that leads to another nested MMIO access leading to a uh, use after free bug. 
So if we want to tackle this enormous input space, uh, how do we do this? We are, um, we, uh, let, well, first let's look at the port IO and MMIO part of the equations. How do hypervisors even implement port IO and MM, uh, memory mapped IO? Well, when a guest, when the guest CPU or the guest tries to access normal locations in RAM, um, that goes through fine, right? There's no, the hypervisor doesn't take over to service those requests generally. Um, but with one, what we want to do with memory mapped IO is instead of letting the device just read or write from that location in RAM or, or uh, memory, or even worse, like the underlying privileged device, we want to intercept that request and handle it in the virtual device code. So what the hypervisor can do is, for example, unmap the pages that correspond to the MMIO range. And so when, when you do that, um, when, when you access an address in MMIO from the guest, you, uh, you trap into the hypervisor's code. And then the hypervisor can inspect, you know, what address led to the trap, and um, inspect uh, the uh, the access, um, and identify, you know, what what virtual device code it needs to run in order to service that request. And uh, the key thing here is that the hypervisor needs to be needs to keep this mapping of guest uh, to guest physical from guest physical addresses to virtual device uh, handlers, right? Um, and it does this in, in something like a table. And the, the hypervisor needs this to, to perform any MMIO functionality or, or port IO functionality. Um, so what we can do is, as, as the fuzzers, we can just keep track of this table. And if we, if we keep track of this table, we always have an accurate representation of um, the port IO and the memory mapped IO regions um, on, on the guest. That was port IO and memory mapped IO. The more complicated one, I think, the more interesting one is uh, direct memory access, right? So there's no table of direct memory access regions because they could be anywhere in uh, in memory. But uh, remember, so how the how DMA works is usually the CPU writes uh, some um, some uh, address of a DMA region over port IO or memory mapped IO, and then eventually the device decides, okay, I need to fetch this device this this buffer over uh, over DMA, and when it does that, um, it uh, it can't just dereference a pointer passed from the guest, right? Because the the address space of the hypervisor is completely different from you know what the what the guest view of of the, the address space is. So it needs to somehow convert the address that it gets from the guest into an ad an, uh, into an address or access into a buffer that it can actually reach from the context of the hypervisor. And to do this, hypervisors generally implement a memory access API. So QMU implements a, a set of functions that are uh, convenient to use for virtual device developers to just re uh, read or write some data to a from a, a DMA location in guest memory. And of course, you probably know this, the, what's coming already. Um, yes, the fuzzer can hook these memory accesses, this memory access API. And in fact, what it can do is uh, interrupt execution uh, or uh, intercept the execution of the memory access API and make sure that there's some fuzz, uh, fuzzed data um, at the location that the API is about to access before it um, um, returns execution to the memory access API. So uh, when a device accesses some data over DMA, the fuzzer takes over execution quickly fills in that region um, with randomized data and then gives access back or uh, gives execution control back to the memory access API so it can read that data and um, and as if it was always there. So to, to bring this all together, we we hook into these two um, uh, hypervisor, essential hypervisor constructs. So we have this table of port IO and MMIO regions and the DMA access API. And then we have an interpreter basically for all of our fuzzed inputs where we, where we interpret uh, fuzzer input, uh, fuzzer generated random data into port IO and memory mapped IO instructions. And then when a device eventually tries to perform a MMIO, act, uh, a DMA access, we uh, use some of the fuzzer, uh, fuzzer provided data to uh, fill uh, that DMA region in uh, just in time uh, and eventually, 
uh, we will find some crashes because uh, this this way we we can guarantee that each uh, uh, byte inside the fuzzer provided input is going to directly uh, impact uh, a virtual device in some way. We're not we're we're not at risk of wasting uh, fuzzer provided data on you know writing to RAM that's not going to be used for anything or writing to uh, a port I/O address that isn't mapped to any virtual device. So finally, uh, one thing that we want to do is you know we hypervisors don't normally have this like just-in-time DMA functionality that we use. So what we can do is we can actually collect a, uh, a, when we find a crash with our fuzzer, we can reorder the, uh, order the commands so that the, uh, any DMA uh, just-in-time commands will directly precede the, uh, pre the prior um, uh, port IO or MMIO request. So that way, um, when you rearrange it this way, by the time the request that triggers the DMA access executes, it's as if the DMA data had already been uh, there the whole time. So um, we implemented this for QMU, and uh, as we were doing this, we kept track of you know the coverage that we achieve over various devices, and we could zoom in on individual lines and to see you know what, how to how to improve our fuzzer. And this was eventually the technique that we came to. And because of the way that our fuzzer functions, um, it's very easy for the developer to reproduce a crash. And that was a big focus as we were designing this. So when I when we do find a crash, we can actually send it to the developer by email, and they can just copy and paste it um, into their existing build of QMU to reproduce the crash immediately. And they can see exactly which uh, 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 port I/O, MMIO, and DMA, DMA requests led up to the crash. Um, so we've already found, reported, and fixed bugs in a wide range of uh, network devices, graphics devices, um, audio devices. And um, there, we've reported over 60, 60 bugs. Um, there, we, there's, I think, six CVs associated with bugs that we've reported uh, up to date. Um, and most of our work is actually already upstream within QMU. Um, and because QMU is such a popular hypervisor, um, our work directly benefits a lot of projects that depend on QMU. And because QMU is open source, we can also take advantage of programs such as OSS Fuzz. So as I'm giving this talk right now, our, the QMU uh, code is being fuzzed in real time on the cloud somewhere, and bugs are being found. Um, and as, as soon as new code gets committed to QMU, uh, we, we fuzz that code as well to, to catch bugs as soon as possible. Uh, that was my talk. I'd like to give a huge thank you to everybody um, who reviewed my code and, and helped me come up with uh, uh, various techniques for fuzzing virtual devices. I'd never be able to do this without um, my mentors and the rest of the QMU community. I think that um, the takeaways from this work can also be applied to a lot of uh, kernel fuzzing and uh, even stuff like browser fuzzing efforts. Um, if you thought this was interesting, you'd like to talk more, here are my contact details be below. And uh, with that, I'll uh, end my talk. Thank you for the amazing talk, Alex. Folks, feel free to um, put your questions down in chat, or you can also carry on the conversation in the breakout room, the link to which I just posted in chat. OK, I guess I'll, uh, I'll go to the breakout room then, uh, Andrilla. Thank you. Sounds good. Bye.